thrilled to introduce Brian Burke. Um, it's actually the first time he and I have met, but we've talked <laughs> on the phone a bunch of times. Welcome, uh, Brian's a partner in Cooley, which is a, a highly respected international law firm. Uh, he's a, uh, I think I have this right, an undergrad at Stanford, law degree from the uh, University of Notre Dame. Um, Brian specializes in uh, disruptive, innovative companies, uh, which is what we're all about for the Venture Lab. And um, super uh, privileged to have him here. He's going to talk about um, funding, basically, for startups and, and your new businesses. Uh, he's got a ton of experience, so I'm looking forward to learning a lot. With that, um, please welcome uh, Mr. Burke to, to this evening's program. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, nice to meet you all. It's great to be here with you. Um, as Brian said, uh, my name is Brian Burke. I'm a partner at Cooley, which is a law firm based in Silicon Valley in California, headquartered in Silicon Valley. That's where we started. We have offices all over the world, so a big international law firm. And I am based in our Reston, Virginia office, um, so nice and local. And uh, as Brian said, I, I work with startup companies, and I'm part of what we call our emerging companies practice. And what that basically means is that I help companies from when they just have an idea, nothing really exists, but the, but the idea, all the way until they have some kind of exit event, and then everything that they do in between. So whatever the legal issues are that come up, um, sometimes that's marital advice, sometimes that's employment law, it kind of depends on the day, right? With startups, there's all kinds of things that come up. Um, and so I'm going to kind of take you through what I would tell you if you came to me saying you wanted to start, if you had an idea to start a company. So from the beginning, and we'll see how far we can get. I don't know how much time we have, but we'll see how far we can get down that path. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to stop me. Um, we'll get as far as we can. If we don't get all the way to the end, then you, I'll stick around and, and, and you can ask questions and you can always follow up with me over email, stay connected, that type of thing. So that's the plan. Um, just to kind of caveat at the beginning, um, when I talk, when I, the type of company I'm talking about is a very specific type of startup. So some of the things I'm saying won't apply to every type of startup or company out there. What I'm going to be talking about specifically is basically the, the strategy that almost every startup uses if they are trying to grow extremely fast and move towards some kind of liquidity event. So they're looking for a home run. Um, they're looking to be a unicorn. They're looking for something really big. They're not looking to just kind of be a lifestyle business and um, be profitable very quickly. In fact, most, if not all these companies will either never be profitable or it'll be a long time before they're profitable but because they're so focused on hyper growth. That's the key. And so some of the things that I'm going to say, you might have heard in other contexts, hey, you know, I've heard that that's actually not the right strategy. Well, for another type of startup, it might not be the right strategy. So that's kind of take it with a grain of salt. And, and the other thing is, I'm going to say a lot of things as if they're the norm or as if every startup in the history of startups has done them, but there are exceptions to every rule. And I'll mention that along the way as well. Um, so with that, we'll start off. So if you come to me with an idea and you say, hey, Brian, I've got this idea. I want to form a company and I want to grow it. And I want to raise money and I want to do something big. We're changing the world, right? Um, the first thing that I have to tell you is you have to keep the end in mind. So if you are working on a startup and you're starting the company from scratch, it's very important from day one and throughout the process to be thinking about where you want to end up, specifically this type of exit or liquidity event, because everything you do along the way um, can impact how that result, how, what's going to happen with that result, right? And you might do something along the way that takes you off that path without you knowing it. And so you want to be careful. And so... The important thing, one of the most important things is coming to someone like me from the, from the beginning, right? Because you want to have the right advisors in place. Because if you just go, for example, to something like LegalZoom or, one, or something that's out there that's, that's just kind of like the free or very cheap option that's going to get you started but might not get you on that right path, you're going to eventually have to come to somebody like me to fix it. It doesn't have to be me. I'm not saying it has to be me, but somebody who knows what they're doing and does this kind of thing for a living. So, so the first thing that I'm going to tell you is that you have to set up a Delaware corporation. And that's, there, there are a bunch of reasons for that that are, that are not interesting and kind of boring. But the, the easy answer for you guys is that 
Um, if you're going to raise money from venture capital funds, which is part of the kind of this strategy, right? You're going to have to be a Delaware corporation. Always exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, you're going to have to be a Delaware corporation. So that's the first thing I'm going to tell you. Again, if you want to understand why, I can get into why, but it's kind of boring, so I'm going to skip over that. So Delaware Corporation, some people will say, well, why not a what we call an LLC or a limited liability company? And there are reasons why. Uh, there are reasons why you would, you might do that. But those are reasons, again, if you are doing a different type of startup. If you're doing this type of startup, which is high growth, trying to raise venture capital, you will not want to be a limited liability company or an LLC. Now, if you have a company today that you already started that is a limited liability company, and you're like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do any of these things. Don't, don't worry. You can, there, there are ways to fix that relatively easily and quickly. So it's not the end of the world if you were already an LLC or if you, know, if you have a friend who started to come in there already an LLC. But if you come to me and you just have an idea, you haven't done anything yet, I'm going to say Delaware Corporation. The next thing I'm going to say is, hey, what does your founding team look like? And what does the equity look like in terms of allocations among that founding team? I'm going to assume for a second that you're coming to me with an idea and it's not just you as the founder. So I'm going to assume there are, let's just say, two founders. And let's say that you're going to split the company 50-50. So the next really, really, really important thing, more important than being a Delaware corporation, because this is the type of thing that's difficult to fix if you don't do it the right way. So this is an important one, is how you allocate the equity between or among the founders and imposing vesting, something called vesting on that equity. So let's just say that Andrew and I are the founders. We're starting a company and we've split, we've split the equity 50-50. And let's say that after a year, I'm on vacation um, somewhere and I decide I'm going to stay and live in that other country and do something completely different. Just I'm done. I'm just kind of like, you know what? It was fun, Andrew, but I'm going to go do my thing. If we just set up a Delaware corporation, we did the first thing right. And we split it 50-50. We did the founder equity that way, but we didn't do this thing called vesting then I will stay in that other country and do that other thing. And guess how much of the company I will continue to own? 50% of the company, right? And that's not the right answer. <laughs> that is not the right answer. And so what vesting does is it says that if I decide after a year or some period of time that I don't want to do this anymore, the company gets to buy back a portion, some, some or all of the shares that I have. Basically the unvested portion. It's a time, usually it's a four-year vesting schedule or something like that. We do what's called a one-year cliff so that the first 25% of my shares will vest after one year and the remainder will vest monthly over the next three years. And so the idea is that I can't just walk away and take a big portion of the, a portion of the company with me. Now you can imagine it again, the reason I'm telling you this is because this has happened and it happens actually quite a bit where the story that I just told you, they're trying to fix a problem where there's some guy on some island somewhere who owns 50% of the company and he shouldn't. Right. And, and guess what? If a venture capital fund comes to invest in that company and they're fired up about how much revenue they have in the product and all these different types of things, and then they see that there's a guy on an island somewhere doing something we have no idea what they're doing, who owns 50% of the company, guess what that VC is going to do? Move along quickly to the next company that doesn't have a guy on an island somewhere with 50% of it. Right. So you see how this, how this works. It's important to make sure that the founders from day one are appropriately incented and have the right skin in the game, so to speak, to make this thing work over the long term. So we call that vesting. Again, there are lots of nuances to that. You can structure it lots of different kinds of ways, but you want to make sure you get it right. So again, I can answer questions about that if you have it later, but I'm going to keep moving quickly just so we touch on all the different things we need to touch on. So you've set up a Delaware C Corporation now. You have allocated your founder equity. So you've got a company and you've got it protected the right way with vesting for your founders, okay? Now you're growing the business. You want to hire people. You want to, maybe you want some, maybe you want to rent some, uh, some office space. Maybe you need to, maybe you're hiring developers, whatever you might. So, so what do you need now? You need money. You need capital, right? And so what you're going to do is you're going to raise your first round of outside capital. And when you're raising your first round of outside capital today, it wasn't always this way, but today, you're going to do it one of two ways. There are basically two, again, always exceptions. I'll say it again, always exceptions to the rule, but basically one of two ways that you're going to raise money for the first round that you're doing. This first round is almost always called a seed round, S-E-E-D, as you might know. And the seed round, um, there's actually a third way. I'm, not, I'm going to talk about the third way after we talk about the first two ways, but the first two ways are, the, are really like if you're going to do it, you're going to do it one of these ways first, and then you're going to move on to the third. So we'll get to that. But the first two ways you're going to do it are called a convertible note 
or something called a SAFE, S-A-F-E, all capital letters. Convertible note is like the traditional way to do it. It's the way that it was done, it has been done for, for the longest period of time. And a convertible note is, is debt. It's a loan. Somebody loans money to the company. But the funky thing about it is that that somebody, whoever's loaning money to the company, does not expect to get paid back. They don't expect to get paid back. That's what a convertible note is. The, the, the reason why is because they are expecting the note to convert. That's why we call it a convertible note. So the convertible note basically says, I'm going to give you a million dollars to fund your business. We're very early on. And eventually, when you raise real money from real, real VCs later on, because today we're just kind of figuring this thing out. It's probably friends and family or maybe some angels. And nobody really wants to pay the lawyers a bunch of money to do a bunch of documents. So we're going to do a simple, just like two page note. And it's going to say, I'm giving you a million dollars. It's got an interest rate, just like other loans have interest rates. And it's got a repayment date. Usually I say like, hey, do it two years. Give yourself a long time because it's going to take longer than you. I usually say, hey, whenever you think you're going to raise that big round of financing, add six months or a year to that because it's always going to take longer. So take whatever that is, add some time to it. Usually it's about two years and you've got to, it takes me very little time to do it from a legal perspective, from the dot for the documents. And so you get the money in the bank and you're off to the races. The, the way the note works is it says, we're giving you this million dollars today. And someday in the future, you're going to raise more money. And you're going to, when you, when you raise more money, you're going to be selling stock to investors, right? In, in more of a, a traditional uh, preferred stock financing round, which we'll talk about. And when you do that, you're going to you're going to price the company. There's going to be a value because you have to come up with a price for the stock. When you buy stock, you pay a price per share, right? If you buy public publicly traded stock, right, you're paying a price per share. So if you're doing that, the idea is there's a value to the company. When you do a convertible note, there isn't. You're just saying here's some money that we're loaning you, and at some point in the future, it's going to turn into stock. It's going to convert into stock in the future, and so. What we try to say in the note is we try to say how it's going to convert, what the pricing is going to look like. And the way we do it is by including what we call a discount. So we basically can very, very simple. It's more complicated in the document. But we basically say, hey, listen, if you sell stock in the future, OK, whatever you sell that stock for on a per share price basis, we're going to my note, this million dollars that I that I gave them giving you now is going to convert into that same stock at a discount to the price that is being paid in the future. So let's just say the price being paid in the future is a dollar per share. We don't know what it is yet, but let's just say it ends up being a dollar per share. The way the discount almost always works is that it's 20% off. And so instead of paying a dollar per share, my million dollars buys stock at a price of 80 cents per share in that same transaction. So this note that I have, it accrues interest over time. So I've got my million dollars plus I've got my interest and then, when, I, when the company is doing its next round of financing and selling preferred stock, I'm getting shares of that stock. But instead of paying a dollar like the new people are paying, I'm paying 80 cents a share. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, little wrinkle that we throw in that is almost always used now. It wasn't always in the past, but now it's almost always used. And it's something called a valuation cap. Has anyone ever heard of a valuation cap? No, okay, good. So a valuation cap is, is um, very complicated and very confusing. And I can point you to lots of resources online that will explain it so that I don't have to explain it in detail here. But I will um, just basically say, I explained the 20% discount. Everybody understands how the 20% is. A dollar, 80 cents, pretty straightforward. Okay. The way that the valuation cap works is when we, do, when, we, when we do this future sale of preferred stock, again, I said we're valuing the company. Let's just say that the company is worth $10 million. And that $10 million valuation equates to $1 per share of stock. You with me so far? Company as a whole is worth $10 million per share. That's $1 per share of stock. My discount price is 80 cents per share. So I get a 20% discount. Okay. I'm essentially saying that I'm paying a valuation of what? $8 million per share. The company's worth 10, getting a 20% discount. I'm paying $8 million per share. Everybody still with me? Now, a valuation cap is a provision in this little document called a convertible note that says, okay, you're going to get a 20% discount unless it would be better for you to have a valuation cap of, I'm going to use an as an example, $5 million. So if my valuation cap is $5 million 
and my valuation in the transaction is $10 million, my valuation cap, instead of a 20% discount, is going to give me a 50% discount. And I will take that discount every day of the week over a 20% discount. So the valuation cap is very, very favorable to the investor. And it's basically saying, hey, listen, Brian and Andrew, we have this company. It's going great. But you know, we don't, we don't want to like invest now and then have you guys get some billion dollar valuation and just get a 20% discount off of that. We want to invest now and make sure that we get the best deal possible. And we think that $5 million is going to be a good deal, even in the future. So we're going to lock that in now. If it's under $5 million, if it's, if it's $4 million, we still get 20% off of $4 million, right? So the 20% discount is the, like, the floor, but then the cap is that valuation cap, whatever that number might be. So that's how the valuation cap works. So you have, when you have this convertible note, again, it's easy money, it's in the bank, but you have these features that, that basically protect the investor. It's not protecting the investor all the way to preferred stock, which again, we'll talk about. It's basically saying, hey, listen, we're, we're coming in early. We're taking more risk than anybody else has taken because this is super early. And because we're taking that risk, you're going to give us the better of a 20% discount or a $5 million valuation cap when this note converts in the future. Does that make sense? So it's like placeholder. We're saying, hey, again, we're going to do bigger things, but for, for today, you just need money to grow this business. So here's the money. Here are the terms on which it'll convert and we're good to go. Okay, so that's how a convertible note works. It's actually debt. So theoretically, again, I said that they don't expect to get paid back. But theoretically, if Andrew and I are kind of floundering after two years and we haven't done anything with our company, we haven't done this bigger fundraise that we're talking about, that note becomes due. We have to pay it back. It's real debt. So it's actually a loan that we have to pay back. Now, in practically in the real world, in my experience, if you get to that, if a company gets to that point where they're like, we, we are at the, we're at the, what's called the maturity date or the end of the note, the end of the note term, and you, and you haven't done the new round yet to convert the note. In, in that case, the lender, the, the investors usually extend it because again, they don't, they, they prefer not to get payback. They actually want the upside of, of investing in the company and having stock. So it's usually how it works. So that's the way a convertible note works. Any questions real quickly on a convertible note before I keep going? I'll go on a convertible note. Okay, so remember, that's only the, oh, we got one in the back. Great. Yes, correct. I'll just cover it. No problem. So does the, the interest accumulation on the debt, does that, um, does that interest only get paid off if they come collecting on debt, or does that mean that the debt will stop or stay? Really good question. Um, I don't know if people who are, who are Zoomed in here could hear that, but the question is, what happens to the interest? So it's a million dollar note in my example, that's accruing interest. By the way, the interest rate is usually something like six or 8%, something like that. And it's simple interest, it's not compounding, um, just as again, as an FYI. And the way the interest works is it just gets treated like the principal. So if after however, however much time, it's a million dollars plus interest, that all converts into stock. So instead of getting a million dollars worth of stock, I get a million dollars plus my interest worth of stock. And if it, you get to the point where you, have to actually pay it back, the interest would have to get repaid too. So the interest either is going to get repaid, again, rarely ever happens that the notes get, re get repaid at all, or it converts, which is what almost always happens. So interest and principal both convert, then you're an owner of stock, just like the new investors are, and you're good to go. You're on the cap table. For yes, another question. Um, is there a protection like for the startup owners that like a 10% discount is so high that they end up having to No, pretty much no. This is it's a great question. The question, sorry for this for the Zoom people, is is there any protection for the founders of the company if the valuation cap ends up being um, so um, extreme when it, when the note converts that it results in the investors owning way more than anybody thought they were going to own? And the answer is not really. I mean, that's kind of like that's why it's important to negotiate a valuation cap. I would say that when I'm negotiating valuation caps. Um, it's completely arbitrary. There's no rhyme or reason like why people come up with what they come up with. I would today, I typically see for a first round valuation cap, it's something like four to $8 million is the valuation cap. I've also seen like $2 million and I've also seen $12 million for valuation cap. So it's just kind of all over the map. And it's really, you know, whatever the investor is used to doing. But again, there's nobody will, nobody can ever tell you with a straight face, here are all the reasons why this should be the valuation cap. It's totally random. Like it's just what they're comfortable with. But no, there are no protections. So once you sign this thing, again, like you're, you're signing up for, for this thing to convert. And 
to convert into stock and, and you are going to be diluted. And we'll get to what that looks like when we talk about that eventual thing that happens when everything converts, because that's the, that's the, uh, when the fun starts. Um, so that's a convertible note. Any other questions on convertible notes? Okay. So remember, convertible note is one of the two ways that you would raise this million dollars. I'm just using a hypothetical million dollars for a hypothetical company. So the other way is what I call a SAFE. And SAFE is an acronym. It stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. Simple Agreement for Future Equity. It was created by a group called Y Combinator, if, we're, if you're familiar with Y Combinator. And it has become um, very, very common. It was way more common on the West Coast initially, and now has come to the East Coast as well. And it's extremely common. I would almost go so far as to say it's 50-50 between who uses notes and who uses safes. Very, very easy description of a safe, okay? We talked, we just spent a lot of time talking about notes and it was kind of complicated. A safe is a note without all the debt pieces. That's the easiest way to think about it. So remember I said a note has to get repaid, has a date on which the note becomes due and it has an interest rate. That's what makes it debt. It accrues interest and it has to be repaid. There's a, there's a repayment obligation. A safe does not have an interest rate. So to answer for the question from the back, you're just looking at a million dollars, no interest, just a million dollars until it converts and it never has to be repaid. It's just a piece of paper that says, here's a million dollars and sometime in the future, it's gonna convert at a discount with the valuation cap. So those, everything else, like I said, everything else is the same. You just never have to pay it back and it doesn't accrue interest. So why wouldn't we use a safe every single time, right? Sounds great. If you're the company, that is the right answer. But if you're a East Coast investor who's stingy, you still want your interest and you want that repayment obligation, right? And so that's why notes continue to be, and, and sometimes it's just because people are used to it, right? That says you can't teach an old VC new tricks. And so it's like, hey, I'm, I've always used notes ever since there were notes. And so we're not using these safe things. By the way, some people will call safe, safe notes. Don't listen to those people because there's no such thing as a safe note. It's either a safe or a note. It's not a safe note um, because the whole point of a safe is it's not a note. And you don't want that. So that's what a safe is. Now, um, it's, it's a little bit funny, right? Like a, what, what is a safe actually doing? It's, it's kind of illegal. For, I'm a lawyer, right? It's kind of a legal fiction. It doesn't, it exists in this legal space that nobody really understands because um, it's not, it's not debt right? A note is debt, but it's also not equity. So that in the, in the legal world, we're talking about pretty much debt or equity when you're funding a, a business. And it's neither of those things. It's not, stop, has no rights. It's like you can't vote it. You, you, there's, no, there's, no, there's no nothing. It's, a, it's literally a piece of paper with a number on it. That's it. So it's this kind of funky thing. And the reason it happened is because of what I said about the notes. Remember what I said about the note? What are the, the investors not expecting to happen with the note? They're not expecting to get paid back. So if you're not expecting to get paid back, why are you using a note in the first place? If that's like the defining feature of a note is that you have to repay it at some point. And so this group Y Combinator was like, yeah, why, why not just take all that stuff out and come up with a fun name for it and call it a safe and you feel good about it because it's safe. Um, so that's kind of how it happened. I mean, that's like my version. There are lots of other, it's, that is a very unsophisticated explanation, but that's what a safe is. So you're, if you have a company and you're raising this initial round of funding, it's either going to be a note or a safe. That's where we end up. And again, you're going to have a valuation cap and a discount and all those things we talked about. There's um, another complicating factor that I can talk to you about afterwards if you like, and that is when you use a safe, there are two different types of valuation caps. We talked about valuation caps and we talked about why they're a little bit um, aggressive and sometimes confusing and they can complicate things. There are actually two different types. One is called a what we call a pre-money valuation cap and the other is what we call a post-money valuation cap. And it's, it's confusing, so I'm not going to go into all the details. The, the one that I see used more often than not now is what's called, the, in case you're wondering, it's called the post-money valuation cap. The post-money valuation cap basically says, hey, a million dollars, I'm investing a million dollars, and if my post-money valuation cap is $10 million, then that means I'm guaranteed to own 10% of the company. That's basically what it's doing. So the clearest way to do it, the cleanest way to do it is the post-money valuation cap. Okay, so you've got notes and safes. You've got valuation caps and discounts. Any questions on that before I move on to the next thing? Yes. 
So on the other flip side, then what are the legal protections for investor when using a safe? Great question. So when you're using a safe as an investor, um, you you put language in there that says, for example, if the company gets dissolved or if the company gets sold, you are basically first in line. So you're going to get your money back before anybody gets anything else. It doesn't put a time period on it. So unlike the note, if, if, if they don't pay it back by a certain time, they have to repay it, theoretically. With the safe, it's saying, hey, listen, we're not saying you have to pay this back in two years. But if you get to the point, company, new company, that this isn't working out, and either you're going to do a, what we call a fire sale or you're just going to dissolve the company, and there's something to, there's something to give out to the people, right, to investors or whomever, then we're going to get something before you will. So there's still kind of this priority concept. And that's basically it. It is a, I mean, the, there's no question that both a safe and a note are risky because honestly, even with the note, even with this obligation to repay it after two years, in my example, like, let's be honest, if, if the company's not doing well, a startup company's not doing well after two years, guess what they don't have? A million dollars to pay back that note, right? And so it's like, the investor's out of luck either way. From a practical perspective, yeah, there's some teeth in there and whatnot, but it's just kind of, he's just kind of out of luck. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So there's not much, it's a big risk. It's a big risk. Any other Brian, questions? We've got, a, we've got a question from the Zoom. Does that plan last during the lifespan of the company? And will the agreement end once the money is paid back? The question was, does the, um, does the note or the safe last for the lifespan of the company? And does it end when the, when the note or the safe is paid back? The answer is, it will last until it's either converted or paid back. And we're about to talk about what happens when it converts. Um, so I hope that answers the question. So it doesn't, it doesn't go for the entire life of the company. It's expected that it's only going to get the company until its first real funding round, which is what we're going to talk about next. Does that answer we had, that a, we had a question. Yeah, thank you. And we had a question back when you were talking about incorporating as a Delaware uh, C Corp. Should and can companies incorporate in multiple states? Uh, very good question. The question, and you guys can't hear that, right? Okay, the question, the question is, um, should the company, we're talking about when the company is starting. So before we're doing the saves to the notes back and we're talking about the Delaware Corporation, right? The question was, should the company incorporate in more than one state? The answer to that question is impossible to incorporate in more than one state. You have to choose one. You should choose Delaware because um, it's where my mom was born. That's why it works that way. That's just kind of how it happened. No, it's because um, it's, it, the short answer is, is because for somehow, I don't know, I actually don't know how, um, Delaware, of all places, has the most developed body of corporate law. And so for a corporation or any other entity type, including uh, LLCs, the law in Delaware is like the, the best for both for the company and for the investors and for everyone. And everybody understands it and knows it. And so that's why Delaware is the place. Now, yeah, what if I, I live in Virginia? And what if I'm starting my company in Virginia? Why am I incorporating Delaware? Well, I still incorporate in Delaware. But to answer the question, if I'm in Virginia, or let's say I have, I'm in Virginia and I have an office in Maryland and I have an office in New York, I can do what's called a, um, a foreign qualification in other states. This is getting into kind of some legal nitty gritty here. But, but the answer is if you are operating in other states and you're not incorporated in those states, you still have to kind of register. It's called registering to do business in those states. That's the way that works. Any other Zoom questions? Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Okay, um, Brian, what's the what are we doing on time? My seven thirty. Is that the? Okay. I mean, you just tell me. I mean, I'm a, I can keep going <laughs> for a while, so I'll be I'll be. Uh... Okay. Great. Um, okay, so you formed your company. You got a Delaware corporation. Founders have what they have. They got their vesting. You had some friends and family. You had some angels. You got a million dollars in the bank. Things are going great. You're growing your business. Let's just say you used, used let's, yeah, actually, let's, let's, I, I should add something here. Let's just say you did a $500,000 note and then a $500,000 safe. You did both. Guess what? You can do both. You can actually do $100,000, $100,000 notes and safes. And guess what? They can all have different valuation caps. You can do whatever you want with notes and safes, basically, again, there are always exceptions to the rule, but the idea is you have a lot of flexibility early on. You won't for much longer, but for now you have a lot of flexibility in how you're bringing money into your company. Okay. So let's say just for, let's say we have one safe out there. That's $500,000 and one note out there. That's $500,000. And let's say 
the safe has a valuation cap of $5 million. And let's say the note has a valuation cap of $10 million. You just made some stuff up. That's all fine. So you, you talk to different investors, they, they did different things. Maybe you raised the, the, the one with the lower cap earlier, and then you kept going and raised another one later. That's all fine. Okay. But now you're at the point where you've grown the business. You've got some real revenue. That's the, that's the ticket to, to the VC money is you got to have the annual recurring revenue. You got the revenue. Things are looking good. And you get the, it's the best day of your startup life because you get a term sheet. And the term sheet is the best thing that could ever happen to an early stage company because somebody has said, I love you and I want to invest in your company. It's a very, very good day because this is what you've been waiting for. Nothing, that thing at the end that we're talking about, the, the big exit event is not going to happen unless you get funded. And the only way you get funded by real funding is if you get a term sheet. So you did this note, you did this safe. Now you get a term sheet and the term sheet says, term sheet for series seed preferred stock financing. That's what it's going to say. Series seed preferred stock financing. What does that mean? Well, when you set up your Delaware Corporation and you gave the founder stock to different people, you gave everybody something called common stock. Common stock, just very simple, very common. That's why they call it common stock. There's no bells and no whistles. It's just stock. You can basically vote the shares and that's it. Nothing special comes along with it. But when you're about to take money from VCs because you get a term sheet, they are not going to buy the same stock that you have as a founder because they are special, a lot more special than you are as a founder. They are venture capitalists and they deserve special things. And so we're going to give them a bunch of special things because if we don't, they're not going to give us their money. Okay. So you get a term sheet. Term sheet's like three or four pages long and it tells you here are all the special things I want in order for you to take my money. I, and I call them bells and whistles. Um, I was talking about this is funny. I was talking to a German company one time. And um, I was talking about bells and whistles. And um, at the end of the call, they were like, I can't do a German accent, but they were like, can you tell, we really like what you said about all these jingle bells. And I was, <laughs> I was like, that's, I, anyway, that was my, that's my favorite bells and whistles story. So, um, so you're going to get a term sheet and it has all these things in it that you don't have as a founder. You don't have any of these same things. You have common stock. That's why that's called preferred stock because they're preferred over you. You are common. No good. Okay, I think I've made that point. So you get a term sheet. It says series seed preferred stock. A while, a little while ago, it didn't say series seed preferred stock. It said some. It said something different. It said series A preferred stock. But something has happened. We don't really. I don't really know why. Something has happened where series seed has become the first real round that you do instead of series A. So you go notes and safes like we talked about. Then you go series seed, and then you go series A. That's just kind of how. It works. Don't really know why. No real explanation for that. But um, we say Series Seed is the new Series A. And so it is. So you get a Series Seed term sheet. If you are a founder and you get a Series Seed preferred stock term sheet, what is the first thing you're going to look for? You're going to look for the valuation because you think that that's the most important thing is how much your company's worth. So you get a Series Seed preferred stock term sheet. It says, I want to invest in your company. And your pre money valuation is. $15 million. That's pretty nice, right? We have a note that says our cap is 10 million or wait, which one was it? I don't remember. One says 10 million, one says 5 million, right? So we've got 15 million. That's pretty good. I'm, I feel pretty good about it. And it says, I want to invest $5 million in your company. So I've got a $5 million term sheet with a pre-money valuation of $15 million. What that means is very simple. It doesn't mean that the VC did a bunch of Excel gymnastics and said, this company is definitely worth $15 million. I can hear all the reasons why. That's not what happened. What happened is the VC said, I want to own 25% of that company. That's what they said. And, and how are they communicating that to you? They're saying, your company today is worth $15 million. Is that a white, I do a, is that a white board? No, I'm not going to use a white board because I have to stay behind the camera. Um, your company today is worth $15 million. I'm going to invest $5 million. So after I invest, how much will your company be worth? $20 million. And how much of that company will I own? $5 million. And what is that equal to? 25%, right? I did that right. right? It's in my head. So check me. Okay. 25%. That means when all this is done, the investor is going to own 25% of your company. So again, very important point. A lot of founders think 
The pre-money valuation is how much my company is worth. Guess what? It's not. It's actually just a funky mechanism that the VCs use to tell you how much they want to own of your company. Okay? So they're saying, by putting those numbers on the paper, they're saying, I want to own 25% of your company. And I'm going to give you $5 million for it. So if the VCs want to own 25% of your company and they're giving you $5 million, as founders, how much does that leave you with? What's, what's 100 minus 25? 75, <laughs> right? So you might think to yourself, oh, that's great. I'm still going to own 75% of the company. But guess what, founders? What did we do along the way? We did a safe and a note. And guess what? Those have valuation caps in them. So for my $15 million valuation cap, sorry, for my $15 million valuation, I have, a, I have to factor in these notes and safes that are converting at 10 and five. And so if you think of this, we got a, if I had a thing to write on, I'm gonna draw a pie, okay? And the only thing I know for sure, when I look in the term sheet, is that 25% of the pie right here, right? Is this something? Okay, so that 25% piece, I know that, guess who's getting that? Not me, that's gonna to go to the VCs, they've got it. But then I have to figure out what's gonna to happen to the other 75%, right? And that's gonna be some combination of founders and the notes and the safes, because they're gonna convert in and they're gonna own that same series seed preferred stock we're talking about. And something else, which is another little factor we're about to throw in called the option pool. Everybody heard of stock options? Okay, when you get a term sheet, from a VC, one of the things the VC will say, VCs will say when the term sheet is, we want there to be typically something like 10% of your company set aside in an option pool. And the reason why they're saying that is because when they're investing in your company, they're looking at Andrew and Brian and they're like, these are some good, these guys are good, but they don't have everything. They need this person to come in. They need Monica to come in. They need, a, a, they need a hotshot developer. They need sales. They need a CFO. They've got, maybe they're technical, maybe they're just technical founders and they need some, uh, someone with more business sense. And guess what? They split it 50-50 from the beginning. If, if we're bringing Monica in, Monica's not just going to come in to get paid some tiny startup salary. She needs there to be upside. And so that's where the stock options come in. And so when you're looking at the pie, right? All of a sudden, there's another sliver of it. You got the sliver for the VCs, 25%. You got the sliver for the notes and the safes, which we got to figure out how much that is. We don't even really know yet. And then you have another sliver for the options. So you thought you were going to get 75% as a founder, but that pie just got cut up real quick, right? And all of this is in that term sheet. In the first paragraph, like we're not even on page two yet. And we got to stop in like 10 minutes. <laughs> so the, the thing you're looking at first is valuation. You're like $15 million. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. The whole point of what I'm saying is you can't stop at the, at the valuation number. You have to think about what does that mean, right? What does that mean for how much they're going to own? What does that mean for how much I'm going to own? What does it mean for the option pool? What does it mean for the safes and the notes that I've already given to other investors? All those things have to be figured out. And we put all of that into a spreadsheet and we call that spreadsheet a pro forma capitalization table. And the term sheet will sometimes, not always, but sometimes say attached as exhibit A to this term sheet is a pro forma capitalization table so that we can all be very clear, the VCs and, and the founders be very clear on what this whole thing is gonna look like after we close this, this, round, this round of financing. And that's really important because you don't wanna sign the term sheet and sign a deal and not understand Who's going to own what when you're done, right? Because if, and again, I wouldn't be saying this if I hadn't seen this happen. If you do that and then you're surprised because you didn't realize that you were actually going to own 47% instead of 75%, that's a big deal. So it's really important. So paragraph one, valuation, all those things come into play. Very important to think about. So that's the first thing I, I look at and first thing founders will look at when they get a term sheet. Everybody cool on that? Any questions on valuation? or any of those things. I'm not, again, I'm not going into how the notes and the safes convert because it's pretty complicated and there's, some, there's a lot of math, which I'm not good at. So we got to be, and we got to move on to the next thing. But if you want to talk afterwards, I can, I can talk more about what that looks like. Yes. What's the typical amount of giving up at this stage? Like let's say maybe even a FinTech or just yeah. in general, like what, what are you looking at? Yeah. The question for those on Zoom is how much are you typically giving up at this stage? 
Um, it is like a good lawyer. It depends. That's the typical right. answer, right? Yeah. Um, so you'll see it. It will be all over the map. Um, but I, the example I gave of giving up 25% to the new money coming in to the VCs is pretty typical, but there's going to be those other slivers that you have to figure out for the notes in the safe. So it's, it would be, it would be rare. I, in the example I just, I threw up that you end up with 47%. It would be rare for founders to lose control of the company. So to go under 50% in an early round like this, that would be rare. I would, I would not to, I use that as an extreme example. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're not looking at giving up control on an overall percentage basis, but you're gonna be diluted relatively um, significantly. Yeah, more so than you than people yeah. usually think. Yeah, in the back. It's, it's a really good question. The question is when the venture capitalists um, come into the company and write their check, are they giving any, is there anything else that comes with it? Any kind of support for the company? And the answer, once again, is that, that it depends. There are some VCs who they are hands off and they're just like, you know what, take our money. We're going to be on the board of directors. So we're going to have some visibility into your company. And we're kind of here for you if you need us, but we're not going to get our hands dirty because we did that before, right? And so we're not going to do anything. There are others that will come in and say, we're going to be more operationally involved. And we might have people who can actually provide services to the company. For instance, like back office type things. There, there, there are things that sometimes these VCs will do. So there are sometimes, sometimes um, a VC will bring what we call more than a check. So they're bringing something else to the table, but it's not like, it's not like automatic. And so it just kind of depends. And, and really what it comes down to is companies, if they're getting more than one term sheet, they really look for the VCs that they feel like are the best fit with the company from a personality perspective, maybe from an industry expertise perspective. A lot of VCs are VCs because they've done something like this before and they were successful. And so a company says, hey, I want that person to come invest in my company because of, of what they were able to do in a similar space, that kind of thing. Yeah, Brian. How, how does a, a young student founder business determine which value should be put in the there? Yeah. Sort of calculator. I know you talked about, you know, Excel spreadsheets with, with these VCs. What, what, pretty, what are a couple things that an investor would look for to make an evaluation? Is there multiple that sort of thing? Yeah, good question. So for people on Zoom, the question is, how would a young founder um, analyze or determine whether the valuation that they're being given in a term sheet like this, whether it's fair or not? Uh, so that's a tough one because. Um, if you only, I will say it this way. If you only get one term sheet, that's fair. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And, and you need the money, right? You don't, you don't really have much of a choice. If, if you need the money to fuel the growth, you don't have any gas in the tank. It doesn't matter how much what the Exxon on the corner is charging you for gas. You need the gas in the tank and you're going to, you're going to pay for it. Right. So, so you're going to give up whatever percentage you're going to give up in order to get that. So if you're desperate, you're going to, you're going to take it. Uh, if you have multiple term sheets, that's when it becomes, no matter what, it, it, it's important to understand these variables and how the spreadsheet ends up looking at the end of the day. But if you have multiple term sheets, um, it's even more important because, uh, you know, I can give you examples where you have a, a $12 million valuation and a fifth in one term sheet and a $15 million valuation, valuation in another term sheet, but the 12 million is way better for you because of how these variables play out, right? Because if the 15 million says I want a 20% option pool, and this one says I want a 10% option pool, well, gosh, right there, that's a 10% swing, and that's going to be in your favor because you that 20% is owned by you. So um, the answer is it, it kind of depends on, on the context, um, and it depends on how competitive the the um, the round is with the investors. Um, but you asked, like, are there things that I mean can you look at you can you can look at you know comparable companies? Um, I have a lot of people come to me and who are, you know, have companies based here or on the East coast. And they say, Brian, oh my gosh, I got this company. It's in the same space as company X out in Silicon Valley and company X out in Silicon Valley just did their first round on a $50 million pre-money valuation or hundred million dollar or whatever. And so I'm going to get that too. Right. I'm like, not if you're here, <laughs> geography certainly plays. I mean, geography is less and less important because of, you know, things like the pandemic and it's just, you know, people don't pay as much attention to it, but it's still a big deal if you're out there versus here. So that's a factor too. Um, Ryan, I think you, you got close, uh, but we did have a question about, should we, you know, are there situations where uh, you should counter a VC term sheet? 
But, okay, question for everybody in the room. Are there situations where you should counter a VC term sheet? Absolutely, especially in the competitive term. If there are multiple term sheets and you really like a VC, but their ultimate valuation is lower than, than another one, you can say, well, I've got, I, I can just go with this one. I like you all more, but I want it. So you can absolutely um, negotiate. So valuation is absolutely negotiable. So I hope I didn't come across saying it's just kind of hardwired. Absolutely negotiable. Um, again, if you only get one and you're desperate, you can ask and they might just say no, but, but you, they can't, you, you won't know until you ask. So absolutely negotiated if, um, if, you're, if you feel like you should get more. And again, pull the different levers, right? So if, if they ask for a 10% option pool and a valuation that you don't like, ask for a 5% option pool and the valuation that you do like, and maybe you'll get one of those because both of those will ultimately mean you own more, right? So it's important to, to think about how these different things work. Um, there are also some complications with how the notes and the safes convert and you can negotiate that too. But again, that's, that's getting, that is getting too complicated. So I won't cover that now, um, but I have resources I can point you to that talk about that. So yes, definitely negotiate. Pretty much everything in the term sheet is, is negotiable. Um, and again, we're still in the first paragraph. So <laughs> any other questions on valuation? No, it's 729. Should I, what should I do? Okay, I mean, again, just tell me. You guys just leave <laughs> if you want. So the next thing, the next most important thing in the term sheet that you're gonna get is something called liquidation preference liquidation preference. Remember, we're talking about preferred stock and we're talking about the jingle bells, the preferred, the, the, the bells and whistles, the preferred stock. This is the first bell or whistle that preferred stock has, and it's what gives preferred stock its name. Liquidation preference, preferred stock. Preferred stock is preferred stock because it has liquidation preference. Liquidation preference is pretty simple um, and, and it's gonna sound pretty aggressive. But, but again, in my example, the investors are gonna invest $5 million right, into this company. Liquidation preference says that before the founders receive anything in, in a transaction in the future, if you're selling the company, so a liquidity event, liquidation preference, if, you're, if there's a liquidity event, before the founders or the common stockholders receive anything in the transaction, the preferred stockholders get their liquidation preference. So they are the last money that's come into the company, they will be the first money that goes out of the company. Does that make sense? Pretty, it's a, it's a very um, standard principle of VC investing. The last money in the company will be the first money out of the company. They're taking risk. They wanna make sure that they're downside protected. And so they're basically saying, hey, we're gonna get, if there's anything to be had in this company, we're getting at least our money back before you founders see anything. So that's liquidation preference. They, are, they have priority over everyone else, okay? That's the bell or whistle number one. Now there are multiple types of liquidation preference and this is where it gets tricky. And I am gonna explain this one because you're gonna see how uh, the VCs can get pretty nasty. So the, the standard liquidation preference that we see most often is what we call a non-participating liquidation preference. And it basically just means that the VCs get their money back. In my example, they get their $5 million before anyone sees anything else. So if you sell the company for $5 million, they get all $5 million. If you sell the company for $10 million, they get $5 million, and then everybody can share the, the remaining $5 million. Now, again, this is, gets a little tricky. Preferred stock is always convertible into common stock. Always, you can always trade in your preferred stock for common stock. And so if you sell the company for a billion dollars, do you think the VCs are just gonna take their $5 million? No, instead they're gonna be treated as if they converted to common stock because in a, in a sale transaction for a billion dollars, if you just took 5 million and gave it to the VCs, the rest is, is handed out pro rata or on a percentage ownership basis to everyone else. VCs are not going to be too happy about that because they would have gotten a lot more than $5 million. Remember in my example, they own 25% of the company. And so the way the liquidation preference works is they get the greater of their money back or their percentage. Okay. So again, their, their upside is unlimited. Their upside is unlimited and their downside is protected. That's the way to think about it. That's called non-participating liquidation preference. They get the greater of their money back, 5 million bucks, or their percentage 
of whatever the total value of the transaction is. Okay, that's the first type of liquidation preference and the most common. The second type of liquidation preference, and by the way, that's the best for the founders. It's the best for the founders. The second type of liquidation preference is not as common and it's the, it's the best for the investor. And that's what we call fully participating liquidation preference. Fully participating liquidation preference, often referred to as the double dip. And the way it works is this, sell the company for $5 million, they get $5 million, nobody else gets anything else. Sell the company for a billion dollars, they get their $5 million and they get their 25% of the remainder right? Double dipping. Do you hear what I said? They get their $5 million and they get their 25%. That's what we call fully participating. So they're getting their money back and then they're pretending like they didn't get their money back and getting their percentage as well. That's called fully participating liquidation preference. So if you see that in your term sheet, that is something that you would try to negotiate to, to, to the question that came up before. Fully participating liquidation preference. Ouch, it hurts. It's not fun. So we don't like that for the company. For the VC, we love it. But again, that is giving them all the downside protection and then giving them upside plus. Question in the back. Um, fantastic question. Question for the Zoom people uh, from the back of the room was, are there any dividends for the VCs? Are there any dividends for the? I didn't even, I was not going to add that to my list tonight because it takes a little while, but because you asked it, I will talk about dividends. So dividends, yes, in this term sheet, right under liquidation, I think it's right under liquidation preference, would be dividends. And there would, we would talk about dividends. Um, dividends in the, v, in, a VC, in the VC context is basically like interest. And there's, it's almost always simple interest. So it's not compounding. And it's almost always 8%, okay? So if you pay, a, if, if the VCs pay a dollar per share of stock, then every year they get, eight, they get an eight cent dividend. It's always eight cents. It's not, it's not eight cents and then 8% of a dollar. So it doesn't compound. It's eight cents every year. But to answer your question from the back, it does not get paid out quarterly or annually or anything. It never gets paid out in terms of like a cash dividend like to stockholders. And the reason why is because we're thinking about the type of startup that we're talking, just like we said at the beginning, the type of startup we're talking about is a hyper growth startup. And so if this startup that we're talking about ever has the cash actually that actually could be paid out as dividends, the VCs and everybody involved doesn't want the dividend. They don't want, they're not in it for cash dividends. They're in it for the ultimate return, which is going to be greater if the company takes that cash that it has, assuming it has some and use it, uses it to fuel the business to grow the business. So every little bit that the company has is going to be put towards growth. And so the dividends will accrue. And so the dividends will be there and they will get paid out at the end. When the, when the company has this liquidity event, they get added. So you add, ask it at a perfect time because they get added to the liquidation preference. So the liquidation preference in my example of $5 million, it's $5 million plus dividends. And the dividend has accrued annually over time. And so that's what you have at the end. You have this nice little bucket of money that's accrued. It never gets paid out in cash over the life of the company, but it does get paid out to the stockholders when the company gets sold. If that makes sense. Now, another little complication is that um, it's about, I don't know, 60, 40 when you actually have real dividends in a term sheet. So I mentioned that it would be under the liquidation preference paragraph, paragraph two would be dividends or paragraph three, but not, you don't see it all the time. It is, it is relatively aggressive. More often than not, in the 60% of the time category, in my experience, you really don't see, you, you see, a, we call it a non-dividend. It's, it's, it's called a non it's, it's a little complicated. It's called a non-accruing dividend. It's basically a div, it's called a dividend protection or priority, which basically says, we're not going to accrue a dividend. So it's not going to be automatic. But if you ever decide you're going to give a dividend to somebody else, like to the founders, you have to give one to us first. It's a last in, first out kind of thing. It's like, hey, listen, you're not giving money to people unless you give us money, right? That's the way it works. So, so that's the more typical dividend. It doesn't happen unless you're going to give it to somebody else. So that's a, and it's, it is a little complicated. But in general, it's like an interest rate. doesn't get paid till the end. So good question on dividends. So liquidation preference, dividends gets add to, added to it if it's there. 
that's two types of liquidation preference, right? We got the non-participating, which we like. It's just the greater of $5 million or my percentage. We have the double dipping, fully participating, which we don't like, which is both my 5 million and my percentage. And then you have the middle of the road option, which we call capped participation liquidation preference. Capped participation, which, which says, I'm gonna get my money back, my 5 million in the billion dollar example. I'm gonna get my money back and I'm gonna get a little bit of my percentage as well, but I, and, and that's called participating, but I'm gonna stop participating after I reach a certain multiple on my investment, say it's 3x, that means I'll get my cap, my cap on my liquidation preference will be $15 million because I invested five. I have a 3x cap. But what, as a preferred stockholder, what can I always do if I want to? I can always get common stock instead, which means I have unlimited upside. So in that case, in the billion dollar example, Will I take my liquidation preference? No, I will still get the greater amount, which is my 25% of a billion dollars. So the capped liquidation preference is basically just giving you more downside protection than the first type, which is the non-participating liquidation preference. I know it's probably hurting your heads, um, but those are the three types. Yes, question. So, um, in all the Good question. Question from the back for the people on Zoom is, um, what what is the VC really investing in? <clears throat> is there a patent? They have. Shouldn't there be something there? And the answer to the question is, not really. A lot of times it's just the idea. A lot of times it's just because if they're investing in Andrew's company, it's because Andrew had a prior company that he sold for $500 million. And so we want to go, I don't know what he's doing now, but we're going with him. We're going to invest in it. They're investing in the founder. Sometimes it is like, this technology is just unbelievable. So we, we see it and we're tech people and we, whatever it is, we're investing in the technology because they got, maybe it is because they got a patent. Um, so it depends, but some, sometimes there's really nothing there. Um, I've, I've had clients that have gotten term sheets and raised money and they have nothing. They've just gotten, they've sold companies before or whatever it is. Yep. Good question. For the people on Zoom, the question was, what are the different things that you need as a company to have to be able to give to the VC as part of the process, give to potential investors? Is it a balance sheet? Um, what, what are the different things involved? The answer to that question is what I recommend that people have if they're getting ready to raise money are basically two things. Yeah, you're going to need to show them financials. They're going to do some diligence and things like that. But the two things as you are, uh, as you are talking to investors, even early on, are a pitch deck and a one-page executive summary. And the one-page executive summary and the pitch deck are both going to have a, a slide or a picture in it. And that picture is just going to look like this. And that it has no bearing on reality whatsoever. It's just a picture that says, if you, this is what my company is going to do. So you better invest in it now. Train's leaving the station. You, the, the, be, the, 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 the best thing you can give to a VC is FOMO. You don't want them to be afraid they're going to miss out on something. Um, and, and again, once you have one interested, you'll have more interested. But, but the answer to your question is, yeah, you want to have as best you can as an early, because as an early stage company, you're not going to have much to show. But um, there's all kinds of resources out there. And when, when we, have, with our clients, we'll help them with their pitch deck and with their executive summary and, and um, you know, to kind of put their best foot forward. And there are some resources I can point you to. There's some helpful articles out there online that say, hey, these are the most important slides you need for your pitch deck, those types of things. Um, but yeah, and there'll be, once you kind of start getting down the path, there'll be some more, some real things they want to look at, get under the hood, kick the tires, that type of thing. Yeah. Yes, Andrew. So between the notes or say and the term sheet, I know the answer is going to be the same. <laughs> is there supposed to be revenue? Like, are you using the money from the notes to actually produce some revenues? Yes. Um, so for the Zoom people, the question was what between the between when you're raising money on the notes and the safes and the and the series seed preferred stock term sheet, is there revenue? What's what's kind of what's happening? 
And the answer to the question is absolutely. In order to get that Series C term sheet from a, from a venture capital fund, um, you almost always have to have meaningful revenue. Here, again, the, the, all bets are off on the West Coast. It's there, you get term sheets for, not, again, very little from, you know, for real, from real VCs. But around here, it's, it's difficult to get a term sheet unless you have real revenue. Some people would even say like, you got to do like a million dollar quarter or something like that. Like there's, there, they need significant, it, it'll depend on the VC and depends on the, the industry and depends on the founding team and all that kind of stuff. But the answer to the question is the purpose of that early money with the notes and the safes is to is to get to a point where the VCs will be interested, and that means revenue. That means and now again, exception to the rule. It could mean maybe it's not revenue, but maybe it's a couple blue chip customers. Like, hey, I've got this deal with Facebook, and I've got this deal with whomever. Like, you've got these big name customers, and what you're doing, and and so it's not actual revenue yet, but you're showing that you know you're in the big leagues, and and this is gonna this is gonna be something that VCs want to invest in. There's something that they're saying, yeah, I can invest in this because if it's not actual revenue, it's, 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 you've proven it before because you're a repeat founder or it's because you've gotten the attention of these big time companies that uh, you know, usually don't give small companies their attention. So yeah. Oh, once you have purposeful revenue and then you're eligible for a term sheet, what's the advantage of going to the um, private or a venture capitalist group versus maybe going to a SPAC and going public through that? Good question. For the Zoom people, the question is, um, if you are at the position where you can get a term sheet, what's the advantage of doing a SPAC, of, of getting a, a VC term sheet versus doing a SPAC or something like that? The answer to the question is, um, there was a time very recently when SPACs were hot and there were lots of SPACs happening, um, but that time has, has ended. <laughs> and so the advantage today is you probably, the, the SPAC market is just cooled off significantly. So it's just not as much of a thing. But when it was a thing, the answer to the question is, um, even, a, even the SPAC folks who were looking to scoop up companies and essentially make them public, um, those, that process still requires something. And that something is usually more than what you have when you're getting the Series C term sheet. So the answer to the question is, most of the companies that I saw successfully SPAC were companies that had gone through what I'm talking about and maybe even a couple more of those rounds before they spac so this is what this would if SPACs were still happening, you know, as they had been, um, this would be a stepping stone. This could be a stepping stone towards it, but it wouldn't be a, a SPAC wouldn't be a replacement for this. Um, si similarly, an IPO is eventually what you could get to, but you wouldn't go straight there. So this would be a stepping stone to that. And the SPAC kind of accelerated that and said, okay, you know, you're not really ready to be a public company, but we still want you to be. So we're gonna do this SPAC, and all of a sudden you're public, and it's way before you could have been versus through an IPO. And that's kind of why they stopped working well because it didn't, that's not a good recipe. So anyway. Stocks peaked in 2021, or I guess would have been 2020 and then they died off in 2021. Um, we, we still did some in 2021, um, but I couldn't tell you when exactly that kind of like, I mean, like there's still companies that are trying to do them. So maybe who knows, but in, I have, I have had, you know, recently it hasn't looked good from my, from, from where I sit. So um, so I'm tons of VC term sheets flowing right now, but not many SPAC term sheets. So you know how it goes. Um, Brian, you want me to shut it down? Uh, five minutes. So. Okay, perfect. I can cover a couple of things. So the term sheet where I'm not going to go through the rest of this stuff, but, but remember here you are, you've got this series C preferred stock term sheet, bells and whistles are coming and you're, you're going to be selling preferred stock. You got to understand what the cap table looks like. What else is going to be in there at a high level? When you look at a term sheet, you're basically looking at two different types of things. You're looking at economics and you're looking at control because what's happening when you're doing this in this type of transaction is there's an economic impact on your company, which we talked about. That's really, it's the impact on you as a, as a founder. What is this cap table going to look like when we're done? But then it also impacts the control of the company. I said that in this type of deal, it's extremely rare for the founders to lose control on an ownership percentage basis. So it's very rare that the founders are going to own less than 50% when this is all said and done. But they will lose control on a um, through what we call blocking rights or protective provisions. So there are other things that are going to happen in the term sheet, other bells and whistles that are going to take control away from the founders from a practical standpoint. And it's important to look at those things as well. So for example, 
one of the things that you're going to see in the term sheet is a list of things that the company can't do without the consent of the VCs. So it's, again, we call them blocking rights or protective provisions. It's usually like seven to 10 things. And they're things that you would think of as big ticket items. So you cannot sell the company without the VC's consent. You cannot do your series A round, your next round. You can't do that unless they're going to approve of it. You cannot hire or fire the CEO without their consent. Um, you cannot raise or you not you cannot incur debt about usually above a certain threshold without their consent. You can't repurchase stock from founders. You can't um, reclassify stock and kind of try to move things around. In other words, anything that has to do with equity, you're not going to be able to do it without their consent. And anything that has to do with um, future things like big transactions, you're not going to be able to do it without their consent. So there is a new sheriff in town. When you when you sign this term sheet, you are not going to be able to do a lot of things without their consent. That's a big piece. Of, a lot of the bells and whistles have to do with them coming in and saying, we are now driving the ship. So very important to understand that. Again, it takes up a lot of space in the term sheet and I just kind of glossed over it, but that's a big part of it is control. Now, a piece of the control that comes into play is the third final thing I'll talk about, which is the board of directors, the board of directors. So when you get a, a term sheet, it will almost always say that the VC wants to be on the board of directors. They want a seat at the table, the board of directors table. And in the case of this company that Andrew and I have, it's most likely the case that we are both right now, the only members of the board of directors. We're the founders. There are two of us. So we're both on the board of directors. We call all the shots. Well, now with this VC coming in, the VC is going to be on the board of directors. That's a three-person board of directors. And guess who still controls that board of directors by majority vote? Andrew and I do. Very, very important. If you are getting a series C preferred stock term sheet, and that series C preferred stock term sheet says that the board of directors should be, say, five people, and three of them should be appointed by the VC, and two of them by the founders, guess what they're doing? They're taking control of your company, and that's not okay. That is very, very, very unusual for a series seed early stage round. Like I said, on the voting side, it's very, very unusual to have for the founders to have less than 50%. On the board of directors, same thing. Very, very unusual for the founders to not control the board of directors in this early stage round. So something to look out for if you're ever looking at a term sheet is what that board of directors looks like because it's important for the founders and it's pretty standard for the founders to continue to have control of the board of directors. Because the board of directors is, as Everybody knows it's an important role and it's just, it's a little early to just give that up as founders. So that's the last thing I would, I will touch on. That was four minutes. Um, with the last minute, I'm going to mention two things, resources. So um, the law firm I work for Cooley, we have a regular law firm website, which is Cooley.com. You didn't never really need to go to that website. There's another website we have, which is called CoolyGo.com. And that's the website you can go to. CoolyGo.com is a separate website we created, which is just for entrepreneurs. So Cooley does all kinds of things, um, you know, law, big law firm things. But my, my group has this special website where we have all kinds of articles and resources. You can actually go on to CoolyGo.com and create all the documents that you need to set up a, set up a Delaware corporation. Um, and do all the stuff that we talked about at the beginning. You can go on to CoolyGo.com and you can create notes. You can go on to CoolyGo.com and you can create safes. You can go on to CoolyGo.com and you can create a series seed preferred stock term sheet and all of the documents that you need. And you can do all of that yourself for free without even paying me. I don't recommend it, but you could theoretically do that. <laughs> I still recommend that you have somebody like me involved because even if you go and push all the right buttons on CoolyGo, there's like there's things that make sense to have some advice on. So Cooley Go, it's, and it's, it's, it's also articles. There's articles on there about how notes and safes convert, by the way. So you can learn all about that. Again, I didn't go into details. Um, there's stuff in there about founder equity, about options, all kinds of things. Um, there's stuff on there about um, trends and terms like liquidation preference. How often do you see the double dipping? How often do you see the middle of the road? Those types of things. We, we aggregate the data from all the deals we do across the country and we put it all on there so you can see what's market, what's standard, those types of things. So CoolyGo.com is really a fantastic resource. And then the other resource is when you're actually getting to the term sheet stage, so not the earlier stuff, but the term sheet stage, there's a fantastic book called Venture Deals, How to Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist. And it's by a guy named Brad Feld, who is a prominent guy in the VC world. And back in the day, he had a blog 
and he would blog about this. He would blog about all these things that I'm talking about, all the bells and whistles. He would do blog posts on liquidation preference and dividends and all this stuff, right? And then he just put it in a book. So you can just go get the book now. So Brad Feld Venture Deals is the book. Highly recommend. It goes through all the different bells and whistles and explains them in ways that you can, you can understand way better than I, than I explain them. Um, so Cooley Go, Brad Feld's book. That's really all you need. Definitely still need a lawyer. <laughs> Trust me.